Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to Pave the Way Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Helbeck, and today I have one of my good friends from South Carolina, Brandon Barnes. If you guys are not familiar with Brandon, he's a powerhouse investor down south. He's buying a lot of property. He's flipping a lot of houses. He's renting a lot of houses. He's got a lot of experience, and he became one of my good friends because we're in the same uh, mastermind called Investor Fuel. So I've gotten to know Brandon quite well, and uh, it's an honor having you on the show today, buddy. Awesome, Greg. I appreciate you having me, man. I look forward to uh, to an awesome time here. Awesome, man. Well, listen, let's just get right into it. So can you kind of give uh, the listeners a little bit about your background and and your story before you got into real estate and then transition how you got into this business? Yeah, man. So uh, I've been in real estate July 4th. uh, This year will be three full years. Um, These two little angels behind me are what got me into real estate. Uh, I spent 17 years in food and beverage. So I managed my family owned their own business for 13 years. And then when the economy uh, went south, we ended up losing all of that. And then uh, I went and worked as a manager for you know restaurants here in Charleston. Uh, ended up meeting my business partner mentor. Uh, he was a local at one of the restaurants that I managed, and uh, that was kind of that was kind of it. I thought that I was going to have to go be a real estate agent and, and figure it out that, that way. And I luckily found him, and it kind of changed the trajectory for me for sure. That's amazing, man. So what, um, so what, how did you, how did you end up? So give me the story on how you kind of met your partner. Cause I don't think we've ever had this discussion before. Every time we talk, it's always about like marketing stuff and habits. So I'd like to kind of hear a little bit more about that background and how you ended up kind of becoming such a successful investor quickly. Yeah. So it was, uh, so I did actually did my first investment deal when I was 21. I didn't even know I did it. Um, but I bought a mobile home and it was going to be something I was going to fix up and live in because it was the land was behind my parents' restaurant. So, well, when the uh, economy went south, where I lived was, I think there was like 200 people in my town. I graduated with 18 people, 20 people. Um, So it's a really small town. So there was no, there's no industry there for a job. Yeah. I came home, well, ended up selling my mobile home on a land contract. I had no clue what it was. I didn't know anything (laughs) about it. I just knew that I wasn't going to live there and the people that wanted to buy it could make monthly payments. So fast forward, you know, a couple years later, uh, I have my first kid, uh, Penelope, and we're living paycheck to paycheck, you know, living in a small apartment, and we keep getting this $450 check every month. And so I was like, I looked at my wife, I was like, how do we get more of these checks? Like, like it, they, they always seem to happen when we had to buy diapers or pay bills or whatever it was. And um, so I was like, well, I need more rentals. I need to be a, like a real estate investor. So I would, I worked uh, a full-time management job working about 65 hours a week and then went to real estate school on top of it. So basically I would work from 5 p.m. to 2 a.m., get up at 7 a.m. and go to class and then go back to work. And that's what I did for a whole month. Holy cow. But I knew at the end of it, like I was going to get out of food and bath. And uh, during that month, my bartender, uh, her and I one night after work were sitting there talking and she's like, there's this guy he flips hundreds of houses and makes millions of dollars every year. Like you should go talk to him. And so I just approached him one day. He, he would come in on Saturdays and watch soccer. And I would, I just approached him. I was like, Hey man, so I, I heard what you did for a living and I want to do what you do. And he, he kind of chuckled and asked me, uh, what do you think I'd do for a living? And I told him exactly what she told me. And he laughed because everybody thinks that's what real estate investing is. Like you flip homes and make millions of dollars. Yeah. It's super um, easy. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Um, so he laughed and, and we just kind of like started to become friends and he gave me the book, you know, the, the traditional kind of starting book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah. Um, I went home and read it in like two days. I went back to him and I was like, what's next? And then he gave me the one thing and I read that book. I went back to him. I was like, what's next? And then I read uh, Millionaire Real Estate Agent. Okay. Um, and I went back. And so like I read three books in a, in a span of maybe two weeks. And I hadn't read a book in 10 years since my freshman year of college. Yeah. And uh, he could tell it was serious. And that's when he, you know, offered the opportunity to kind of work for the company that I now run um, with the hedge fund. So that was kind of the, the, the way it all kind of started. That's I guess. amazing, dude. That's, and is this Matt? 
That's Matt. Yeah. This is Matt. Cause I've met, I know Matt. Okay. So this was Matt. Okay. Cause I remember yeah. I met him in, in Fort Worth and I'm like, Oh, that's your partner. Like I never like yeah. connected the dots. Okay. So, wow. That's a, that's a lot, a lot of, a lot of good stuff you said there. So, you know, you're sick and tired of your job. You knew you wanted to, you know, get in this business for your family, right. And to have a bigger, you know, life and not have to worry about money. And uh, man, that's a great story. I respect the hell out of that. And I love hearing stories like that. So let's kind of fast forward now. So you, you jumped in the business, obviously you're massively successful now. So what were you doing? Cause you know, I actually first heard of you, man. This is funny. I, I was listening to a Joe McCall podcast. Uh, this was like two years ago and yep. the title was like, this dude's flipping 30 houses a month. And I'm like, Oh yeah, let me see this. And I played it and it was you and your partner talking about you're doing these hedge fund deals. And I was like, Oh my God, this guy's doing a lot of business. And I never, I don't yeah. know you and I have ever discussed it. So I guess this is the first time. What the heck were you doing? How are you doing this? And just kind of give me the snapshot of your old business model. And then we'll transition into what you're doing today. And because you've pivoted a lot, in, you know, in, in a good way. So what were you guys doing with this hedge fund thing? Because you guys at the time were doing like insanely high volume. You guys were doing hundreds and hundreds of deals a month or a year. Yeah. Plus a month. Yeah. So it basically what happened. So when I started in real estate, um, a hedge fund that my business partner was head of renovation for. Uh, was buying strictly on the MLS. You know, they would kind of buy from a wholesaler here or there, but they didn't know how to, they didn't know how to. And so they bought all their deals from the MLS. Well, what I was brought in to do was to kind of like create an off market arm for them. Yeah. Um, and so they said, here's my buy box. I'm going to buy every three bedroom, one bathroom over a thousand square feet. And this year built that fits this cap rate. Every one that you can find in these 17 cities, I'll buy. Um, and so when I started, I was like, you know, this is going to be easy. I mean, I just picked up Zillow, called for sale by owners, and I started doing deals. Um, and then we ended up doing, I started July 4th, and by the end of that year, we did like 50 deals. And I had never done a deal in my life. And that was when I realized like how big the opportunity could be. Um, so then what we started doing was hunting for wholesalers in all, all the cities that we were in and we did some direct seller marketing, but my biggest focus was getting to know every wholesaler in every market that we were there and just get them to funnel all of their deals to me. Because what happened was, is the fund paid us a flat fee. So Greg, if you sent me a deal and you were going to make 20 grand on it, I, it didn't matter either way to me. I made my fee. You made what your assignment fee was. And so yeah. you would keep sending me deals. Uh, oh, and so, I mean, I, I have wholesalers that I would do seven or eight deals a month with in different cities. And so my job basically was just to funnel all of these people into the, you know, and play, uh, you know, moderator almost because the fund wasn't very easy to work with. Wholesalers, as you know, can be difficult to work with. <laughs> yeah. So like, I, was, I was in between uh, the two people kind of balancing all of it. Wow. And, and so we, the, the, the most deals I did in one month by myself with no team, no, no, anybody was like 28. Um, and that was, I, I basically, I met the wholesaler, vetted the property, con contract to close. I did all of it, um, in one month. And oh so goodness. it was, it was, it was a massively, um, big learning experience for me. Um, and it, it allowed us to propel kind of our investing knowledge a lot faster than some people have the ability to do. Cause I got thrown into the rules of title work. I got thrown in with, con you know, uh, rent rates and construction and all these things that a lot of people, they have to do a deal to get exposed to. Well, I, I got all of it. Yeah. You learn quickly and you just, just, ex you hyper extended the, you hyper compressed that learning curve because of the, you know, the, the action you right. guys were taking. So what was, um, if you think about it, 20 deals, I mean, if this was the month of February, you would have been doing a deal a day, you know, your best month, which is insane. Correct. I mean, that's a lot of, that's a lot of moving parts. And so what, what were some drawbacks? Cause obviously we'll talk about your business in a minute, like today, your business, what were some drawbacks and things you didn't like about that hedge fund model? And then why did you decide to pivot to about to, to basically pivoting to the model that you're currently doing now? Like what, what made you realize like, maybe I should, we shouldn't be doing this. Like what were some of the issues that you were facing? Well, so what happened, in, yeah. what happened in the beginning was we were the exclusive off-market buyer for the fund. And okay. so nobody had access to the fund unless they came through me, which okay. was nice because I, I didn't have any competition out there in the markets um, and they were a big buyer. And yeah. so 
I was able to just go out and funnel people. Well, what happened was they looked at us. I think we did our second year. I think we did like a hundred, like 240 transactions or something like that. And they saw this flat fee on all those transactions and they thought, Oh, well, these guys are making, you know, all this money. Well, they didn't think about the fact of the cost of, you know, overhead business, just like taxes, yeah. like all these things. They just looked yeah. at a number. And so what they did was they took away our exclusivity from the fund. And so then all of a sudden I had, um, to compete with all the people that I was funneling into my business. Mm. What happened was Greg, you knew who my buyer was. And so you would just go to the buyer and then they'd give you a price and then they would go to me and say, Hey, give me your price. And then they would just pit me against my yeah. own buyer. Yeah. And then you're directly competing with them and then the, the value has gone, you know, like your right. competitive advantage is just washed away. Right. And it can happen right. in a flicker, you know, it's not and like they, that. Yeah. They just open it up. And then, so what happened is we had to pivot and go direct to seller. Um, and when you go to direct seller, marketing is expensive, you know, having acquisition <laughs> yeah. managers, marketing, all that yeah. stuff is expensive. And we boiled it down. So they paid us $2,500 a flat fee. Well, when it's just me and I'm doing 30 deals, like that's a lot of money. It's a lot of work, but it's a lot. It's, you know, yeah, you're making um, a lot of money. Yeah. But I don't, I don't have a ton of overhead. Well, we had to build a business. We had to pay for marketing and hire people to, to talk to sellers and have all this stuff. Next thing you know, I think we did the numbers. We were making $275 a deal by the time everything was whittled down um, wow. by making our flat fee. And so uh, February of last year, it was at the Investor Fuel Mastermind. Yeah, yeah, I was there. We're talking about everything. <laughs> yeah. um, I had approached the fund about changing our fee structure. And I was like, hey, listen, guys, we'll keep doing what we're doing, uh, but we're going to change the fee structure to where it makes more sense for both of us. Meaning that if you get a certain cap rate that you want and we yield you a better return, then we can get paid more money. So the better the deal we get you, the more money we can make. Sure, uh, sure. And if, and if we just meet your bottom criteria, we'll take our flat fee and just go with it. Yeah. Uh, because what was really cool is they gave us access to everything. Like I sat next to the director of sales. So I knew what they would pay, what renos were, all this stuff. So I could go and negotiate based on having a hard, fast number at, and at the end. Yeah, yeah. And they basically just ignored my request. And so we fired our fund as a, like a direct buyer. Um, so we still sell to them, but we gave up all of our access to them for the fact of being able to make whatever we want to make on a deal now. Wow. Okay. So that, so you basically, I want to kind of condense that for all the listeners right now. So pretty much if, if the listeners aren't familiar with, with this business, basically Brandon was doing high volume wholesaling. And, and the big thing with wholesaling is it well, there's two things. It's finding a discounted property and then selling it to a cash buyer. Brandon had cash buyers down to a science because he had one buyer he was selling to and they were buying basically everything. So all he had to do was find deals. So he was going out and partnering with other wholesalers and having the wholesalers sell Brandon the deal. And then Brandon was selling that to the hedge fund. And Brandon was just doing that, you know, times 20 or 30 a month. So then Brandon's buyer basically started to release the, the exclusivity, right? And then yeah. he opened it up to everything. And then you had to change your business because then it wasn't working with the, with the margins you had. So let's kind of fast forward now. And that's, that's a really interesting story because you had so much learning so quickly. Where are you at now? Because obviously over the last year, you know, as we've known each other pr pretty well, you've always been making shifts to your business. And I, I really like seeing your growth. So where, where are you at right now on a, on a deal basis? Because I know you're doing more than just wholesaling now. And we, we talk about rentals all the time. So what are you kind of doing yeah. now? What is it? May 1st, 2019. Yeah, not quite. Tomorrow's May 1st, right? Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Look at me. I'm uh, doing California time. <laughs> um, yeah. So we, when we let go of the fund, uh, I mean, to be completely open, like we almost went out of business because we, we didn't have our buyers list built out. We didn't have the things that you need to sustain an actual business. And that's yeah. why I encourage, you know, when I go to masterminds and I hear somebody talking about having like one big buyer, like they're good to have, don't get me wrong, but you need to build out the rest of your business because if that one buyer pivots or changes, it could change your business. Yeah. You're not a business. You're just a commodity or you work for that person. I can't yeah. remember what it said, but you know, there's that quote, if, if you, if so much of your business goes to one person, you're not your own business. You're an employee of theirs. I think Tom Kroll says you're a cash buyer employee or something like that. He has yeah. some phrase. I think it's pretty, that's, it's pretty true and funny. Cause I used to do that. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so we, it, it was, a, it was a tough learning curve. 
we still ended up doing over a hundred transactions last year. Um, but we didn't really buy any rentals. We just wholesaled everything. And at the end of the year, it like, I, I almost kind of dove into a, I mean, basically like a depression because I sat here and I looked at this thing where 200, we're two years into it. We've done over 400 transactions and we didn't own any rentals. And the whole reason that I, we got into this was for these little ones right here was to own rentals to take time and like have time back for my family. Yeah. And, and that was, that was a weird kind of shift for me. Um, and so this year we started focusing on trying to buy more rentals. Um, so like year to date, we've done 34 transactions, so a lot less than what we usually do, but a third of those are all rentals. Oh, wow. Um, okay. So I think we're up to, up to 17 doors. Cause we did buy a couple owner finance, like right at the end of last year. Um, so I think we're up to like 17 doors right now. And so we've shifted now to where our wholesaling company, you know, we're kind of the first buyer. And if it's something that we want to keep as a rental, like we'll pay our wholesale company an assignment fee so that that doesn't lose, that engine isn't lost, but you know, we'd rather keep it for rentals and, and under finance. I love that, man. That's so funny. I'm starting to do that a little bit myself now. I'm looking at all these deals as rentals, like kind of second, maybe I'm closing on a lot more now, but are you, are you now um, in terms of, are you doing with rentals? Are you doing the burst strategy? Are you taking these things down with hard money or private money, adding value, getting the appraisal, and then pulling out the equity to then take the cash and recycle it to the next one? How are you exactly. dealing with these rental? Okay, burst strategy. Yeah. Right? Great strategy, right? <laughs> yeah, dude. So we're in our first, um, we're in our first kind of tranche, I guess. Um, yeah. We bought uh, eleven at one time with, with wow. private hard money, and they were all stabilized except for two. We already got one renovated and rented and we're on our 11th one right now. Um, it's getting renovated. I think it kicks off today. Um, and so once we have those 11 stabilized, we'll go and refinance them. Um, and it's a sweet payday. I mean, I, like we looked at the numbers, we'll pay all of our investors back. We will put some money in mine and my business partner's pocket and we'll have some cash on operating account for our rentals and we'll be cash flowing. So that's amazing, man. <laughs> it like it's like why do you why do you want to sit there and wholesale that deal to somebody else to make them, you know, the same stuff? Yeah, and that's funny you say that because the burst strategy, it's something that I didn't really understand until like really a couple months ago. And it's like you can get the house at a wholesale price, add value, right? Get the thing like reasonably rental ready. It doesn't have to be a full blown rehab. Get yeah. it appraised you can pretty much make that same wholesale fee tax free and now you own it and it's you're adding not only are you adding to your cash but you the key is and this is something David Osborne talks about he's wrote a great book called wealth can't wait he talks about you want to always be adding to your net worth i mean if you take 3 of those a month and let's say you have 40k of equity in each deal you have a partner now you you're increasing your net worth by $60,000 a month just because you're splitting that with a partner too so I mean, your cash is going up and your net worth is going up 60K a month. I mean, you do that three yeah. times a month for four years. I mean, holy crap, you know, you're a multi, multi, multi-millionaire just by doing the same thing you were doing wholesaling, but changing your strategy, you know? Yeah. And, that, and that's what our, like, that's kind of our mindset. So our goal yeah. is your 65 rentals. It's amazing, man. And then, you know, we'll probably still wholesale. We're going to still try to wholesale a hundred, but our, like, we really want to focus on, on the rental side because your net worth goes up, your cash goes up. Um, and my wife and I sat down and figured out like, what does it cost for her and I to live? You know, not, yeah. not a fun lifestyle, but if we wanted to sit at home and just hang out with our kids and live every day, we have that number and the rentals, once the rentals cross that number, then you're financially free at that point. You know, if yeah. I, you know, I'm not doing anything super fun, but I can spend time with my family, which is why I got into this. Yeah. And at that point you do things that bring you energy and, you're not, you're not basing your decisions on money. You're basing your decisions on what you truly want to do. Absolutely, man. And you can even take more risks with deals because now you don't have to worry about the overhead getting paid. You're like, okay, I can go in and take down this land subdivision deal now and rezone it. And if it takes two years, it doesn't matter because I already have the rental income coming in. So it can right. almost make you grow your, your active business too. Cause I still like buying and selling just cause it's like kind of a rush for me. I think it's like fun. It's like a game, but at the end of the day, you know, the real wealth is in the rental properties and owning real estate. Yeah. So that's awesome, man. Well, I'm glad we covered a lot of your business now and kind of your journey. So I want to spend the last half of the show on 
something that you've been taking, you know, a lot, you've really been dedicating a lot of time to this over the last couple months. And I've been super impressed with what I see on social media um, with, with what you kind of decided to do a couple, uh, it was a couple months ago now. So would you kind of my, you know, share with my listeners kind of your journey, your, your fitness journey. Um, and you know, I know a lot of it, but I want the listeners to hear about it. And, and just, I think this is a great topic to, to wrap the show up with today, because I think this is at the end, this is the most important stuff at the end of the day, right? Health and vitality and family relationships. So I'll just kind of let you, you know, take, take it over and share with everyone what you've been doing. Yeah, man. So, uh, and it, and it ties into the business side of it. It ties everything into yeah. beginning this year. Um, and I'll, I'll have some breaking news during this too, as well. Like something nobody knows yet. Great. Um, but, uh, but basically kind of that, that moment in the beginning of this year when I kind of fell into that depression kind of piece where I, I didn't feel like I was living my why. I didn't feel like I was doing what I set out to do. And it wasn't to buy 65 rentals immediately, but it was at least start trying to buy rentals. Yeah. You know, and I wasn't even putting in the effort to do that. Um, and so for basically January and February, I was in this like dark place. My team noticed it. My family, uh, people at Investor Fuel, <laughs> like I, just, I, um, I felt like crap, you know, and, and I didn't know why I couldn't get out of it. And um, March, I went to another mastermind I'm part of, CG, and I talked with a guy, Billy Ross. Um, and dude. You know, Billy, yeah, right down in Orlando, great guy. Yeah, yeah. He, he, and I was texting with him this morning. And basically him and I um, had dinner uh, or after dinner, we had a conversation and I was talking to him and I, I said something like, you know, I'm not that self-disciplined or I'm not that good at this or whatever. And he's like, you're right, because you just said it. He's like, if you say it, then you're it, period. Like, it doesn't matter what you want to be or where it is. Um, and him and I kind of continued that conversation and he challenged me to do this the 75 hard with him. Yeah. Um, and I battled weight. I've battled all that my whole life. And basically, um, he was like, Hey, this is what we're going to do. Um, and this is how we're going to help each other hold accountable. And so on March 25th, so it's been six weeks, um, March 25th, I posted my Facebook post and it was me and my weight and kind of the challenges and my, my thoughts on my food addiction and things like that. Um, and then basically I've just kind of captured the entire journey on social media over the last six weeks. Um, as of this morning, I finally broke the 300 pound barrier. That's um, amazing, so brother. 299.4. So I've lost 21 pounds in six weeks. Oh my goodness. Um, but I've done it the right way. Like I haven't, I'm not starving myself. I'm not dehydrating myself. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm just doing the things that are, you know, a normal person should do. And I'm doing them at a, you know, I'm, you know, added fuel to the fire that I needed. Um, but with that, like going apart, you know, with the health piece, I've started to focus on my mindset and my family. Like, you know, I, I was the first person that would get up at 5am and go to work and then I come home till eight or nine o'clock at night and my kids would be asleep. Um, and I didn't, you know, they, when they were young, they didn't really notice it. But now my three-year-old, even if I go to the gym, she's like, daddy's gone again. And, and like, I hear it. And so I had to start paying attention. Like, how can I focus on my time? How can I focus on my family? Um, and if I'm not healthy, if I'm not in a good place, I'm not going to be here for them, you know, 30 years from now, 40 years from now. Um, and so that's kind of been the big piece for me. And so I've started focusing on affirmations. I take a cold shower, 4 a.m., Every That's day. it, man. Love it. It, 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 it <laughs> has been, I was posting somewhere on Facebook yesterday. It has been the biggest game changer for me in my life. Um, it is, it's not, I don't like, I don't wash my body. I'm not, the shower is strictly for like my mindset. And I go in there. I, uh, so I get up at four by four Oh two. I am in the shower. Um, and I tell myself my positive affirmations. I yell them out. My wife, first couple times that she heard it she thought something was wrong and then now she's used to it um but i but i i give myself my positive affirmations and it's something about it man when i get out of that shower at 407 i'm just like positive i mean i truly can say in the last six weeks since this journey began i haven't had a bad day there have been bad moments and there have been tough times but my day has not been bad and it, it, it's been unbelievable. 
That's amazing, man. And, and I, I'm so happy you're, we're talking about this now because the real estate stuff is great, right? But at the end of the yeah. day, this is the stuff that matters. This stuff will get you the real estate stuff, the habits, the disciplines, the consistency. That will get you the real estate stuff, right? And, and, and man, this is, this is awesome. So what are you doing? The 75 hard, I, I certainly know about it, but what, yeah. what are you doing on a daily basis? So maybe the listeners can take what you're, you're doing right now and implement that because it's, yeah, it's sure. definitely not easy, the, the 75 hard. Yeah, no, it's not. And so um, basically it's two workouts a day, one indoors, one outdoors. Um, you, you commit to whatever your nutrition plan that you want to do, drink a gallon of water, take a selfie, read 10 pages in a book, and then no alcohol. Well, I gave up alcohol in January, so I've not had alcohol in four months. Um, so that was pretty easy because I was already doing that. Yeah. Um, the water wasn't a, isn't hard for me. We keep fresh water in our office, and I've been drinking water a ton my whole life. Um, but it was the workout parts that kind of like getting started for me. So I joined Orange Theory Fitness um, for two reasons. One, I, I solve enough problems in the day at work. Like that's my job as a visionary is, is to, you know, create problems and solve problems. And one of the things that I struggled with going to the gym was what am I going to do today? How am I going to work out? I had to plan it. I find myself not uh, going in and like having good workouts. So Orange Theory is a group based training. And so you go in there, you don't have to think about anything. I just go in at 5 a.m. and my trainer has the whole workout laid out. It's high intensity music, and then they push you the whole time. So it's almost kind of like I can turn my brain off for an hour and just work as hard as I can, you know, to commit. Plus, I'm super competitive. So when you're sitting next to a 60-year-old lady who's just kicking your ass, <laughs> like, and you want to quit, you can't quit. Um, so I try to be in the gym. I do the, try to do the first class every morning um, at Orange Theory. And then at night, we either do a family walk um, I'll, if I'm traveling, I'll go to the pool, um, or I'll go play golf. So that's like, amazing, man. So yesterday I went and played golf. So my nighttime exercise isn't super intense, but I, it's more just kind of getting out and moving for 45 minutes an hour every night. Um, yeah. so I'm not just sitting at home watching TV or something like that. Yeah. Some sort of like activity. So you yeah, no, Correct. that's awesome, man. So, so obviously we're touching on why you did it, why you're doing it, all that stuff. We've covered that. So what's been, I mean, this is a not, I mean, this 75 hard thing. I remember listening to Andy Frisella on his show talk about it. And I mean, it seems like, you know, I think the big thing with this, and I want to hear what your thoughts are. It's like, yeah, like that sounds pretty like common sense. Okay. Like work out twice a day, drink water, read a book and, you know, don't drink alcohol. But like, that seems simple to do for one day. But what's been the hardest part? Has it been the consistency thing? Like what's been your biggest struggle on doing this transformation? Because this is not, this is a commitment. This is not like you don't dabble in this thing. You're either in or you're out. And clearly you're in. To be honest, the two things that's been hard is the reading the book. And really? I, the crazy thing is I love reading. But yeah, reading, you're a big reader. We always talk about books. <laughs> the books. The books have been hard. And then getting your body conditioned to it every day. Like yeah. I'm so, I'm really sore right now. Like I'm, um, I am, uh, and I'm, I didn't go to the gym this morning because my trainer wanted to work on some stuff this afternoon. So luckily like my body's getting an extra break. Yeah. Um, but those are the two big things. Like your body is sore. So you have to, you have to eat the right food. Like you can't sit there and eat garbage. You can't eat, you know, so I meal prep. I have six meals in the fridge, um, and they're all broken down for exactly what I need to eat for the day. Uh, but that's the, I'd say the books have been the hardest. I have, I'm having to almost, and I'm, and maybe the part of the challenge is I've tried reading some different books. I'm, I'm, I haven't read a business book in probably two months. I'm reading a lot of, you know, habit books and, um, health books and things like that, which are tough for me to read. They're not easy reads for me. Yeah. Um, and so maybe that's part of it, but the books have been the hardest part. Wow. Yeah. The books. And are you, are you scheduling time to read? Like, it's funny. You talked about your morning routine. I have a similar routine with the shower in the morning. Are you scheduling time to read every day or are you just trying to squeak in 10 pages whenever you can? Cause I mean, you and I are busy guys. It's like, you know, you have to schedule yeah. that or else it's very hard to do, you know, we're running yeah. around all day. And so I haven't done a good job with uh, scheduling. And that's why I reached out to you last week. Um, I talked to a good buddy of mine, Sherrod yesterday, and he's going to help me hold me accountable a little bit more to my time blocks. And then I have a Trevor Moth kind of habit tracker that I've built out. Um, and so that's, I think that's what I'm going to have to start doing is just, you know, making it forcefully making it um, a habit because it's 
what happens is I'll get up and I'll go to the gym and I'll come home. My daughter will wake up. And then, you know, when she's awake, like she gets my time. And then I come into work and then this happens. And I come home and it's my daughter again or both my kids. And then I want to hang out with my wife. And I'm like, crap, I haven't read my book today. I haven't read any pages. Yeah. And so it's, 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 it's just saying, hey, I'm going to take that time to, to do it and, and make it out there. Um, and that's something that it's, it's a big learning for me is my problem with time blocking is the getting started part, you know? Yeah. And so I, I hired a personal coach. So I have a life coach, which has been absolutely um, a game changer for me. We meet once a week and I have a dashboard that I check into. Um, but our focus over like our first 12 weeks together is teaching me how to show up. And you made a Facebook post was it about the tiny commitments. Remember I told, I, I think yeah, I yeah. Yesterday, it was yesterday, I think. Yesterday, yeah. And so yeah. he, that's, I, I failed at that for a long time in my life, of like committing to my small commitments. And what's happened is my body doesn't trust my mind or have, you know, whatever. Mm. And so he's, him and I are like rebuilding my mindset to trust myself that if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And mm. then also, um, I, if, if I show up, like I, I work hard. The problem is sometimes I have trouble showing up and getting started. Yeah. And so that's our, our big focus now is like, how can I set my time block and then show up, you know, yeah. head and feet in the same place at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Where is it? I'm like that, man. I'm like all over the place. And so basically once you're in the door, you're good to go, but getting into the door can be an issue. Sometimes you're saying. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Listen, man, I love this stuff. I could talk about this habit stuff all day, man. And I, I just want to, you know, commend you and, and respect you so much for doing this and making it public and being transparent about it. Uh, Cause this stuff is not easy. The habits and the, you know, doing this consistent stuff every day, it's hard, right? And it's hard right. for a reason. Like there's a reason most people don't do these things. It's because what does Jim Rohn say? Or he said, it, you know, it's simple to do, but it's simple not to do. It's like, yeah, you could read every day and exercise and, you know, be a good person, but you could also like not do that. And it's like just as simple not to do it than it is to do it. So man, I tip my hat to you so much for this. And I, you know, you've been inspiring the hell out of me, man. And sometimes I don't feel like getting out of bed at four 30 in the morning or four 40. And I'm like, shit, I got other guys that I'm friends with who are doing this. So, you know, I owe it, I owe it to them. So man, this is, this has been a real treat, man. I'm glad we covered a lot of this habit stuff you know, besides the real estate. So besides, you know, before we give, you know, we'll give some contact information out if people want to learn more about you, maybe do some deals with you or talk shop with you about fitness. Yeah. What, um, what, what's like some parting advice for people, whether it's getting your habits dialed in or getting your real estate business off the ground. Cause you have a lot of experience. So if you had to give somebody, I have a lot of advanced people listening to the show. I have a lot of beginners kind of have everyone in between. So if you had to give some parting words for everyone listening to today's show, I'm sure this is going to be a very popular episode. What, what are some parting words for everyone? If you had to pick one thing. I, you know, the, the biggest thing that I took for granted for the last, I mean, I'm 32. So hell, 32 years of my life, 31 years of my life is, is understanding how to focus on yourself. Like mm -hmm. the, the world changes when you, you know, I fl we fly a lot, you know, we fly all over the country, traveling to seminars, doing this kind of stuff. Yeah. And you, and you always hear it, put your oxygen mask on first before you can help anybody else. Yep. And for so long, I didn't do that. I didn't pay attention to my health. I didn't pay attention to my mindset. And it made me a tough leader to work for or under. Um, it made me a tough husband to be married to. And it made me a tough dad for my kids because like, they didn't know who or what they were going to get at, mm. at a moment's notice. And when I changed my mindset to start paying attention to me selfishly, because I knew that if I'm in the right place and I have the ability to impact other people, um, it has changed the world for me. And so I like, I'm getting a little emotional saying it. Like it's, if, if something's wrong, like take the extreme ownership, it's you, it's, it's what's going on in your life and start looking at yourself. Um, and it, it's amazing what doors um, open up. I love it, man. I love that, that share right there, man. That's so powerful stuff. What do they say? Success is an inside out job, right? And I you yep. see it in the books and it's, it's one thing to read it, but it's another thing to live it, man. And you're certainly living it. And I'm very freaking proud of you, brother. I'm, I'm happy to call you my friend and any way I can help you, man, I, I'd be any way I can help you. Let me know. Cause I love what you're doing. I love what you got going on. So if people wanted to find out more information about you, Brandon, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you or your company? Yeah, man. So uh, for me personally, anything on social media, I'm at B Barnes REI. Um, so Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. 
Um, I do have a blog, but it's kind of on the back burner. So I won't, I won't sing it by there because you'll just read the same blog over and over again. <laughs> um, and then the name of our company is Homebuyers Network. Um, so you can visit us at our website at hbnmarketplace.com or you can find us on Facebook um, there as well um, at, HBN Mar- at HBN Marketplace, I believe what it is. Awesome. So, um, well, I'm sure some people will be reaching out because the, this is going to be a very popular episode, I can tell. So Brandon, man, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule. And uh, once again, let me know how I can help you in any way. And I'll talk to you soon, brother. Appreciate it, Greg. Thank you. Awesome.